So welcome everybody to the exciting um, CASA Distinguished Lecture from our Cluster of Excellence. And it's uh, our particular honor to have Andreas Zeller here. Andreas Zeller um, is currently with uh, CISPA in, in Saarland. And uh, prior to that, he had been with the faculty of the University of Saarland for a long time. Andreas Zeller is, is one of the uh, leading scientists worldwide in the area of software engineering. He's fellow of the ACM, which is a very uh, rare and distinguished um, uh, award that he um, received. And his main contributions were in automatic debugging and mining in software archives. Um, and as you all know, we are very interested in uh, um, software aspects. And there's probably also some where we are in Bochum maybe have some lacking something. So I think we're particularly happy uh, to have Andreas here and we're all looking forward um, to your lecture. Yes, thank you very much, Christoph, and I uh, hope you can all hear me well. Let me adjust my microphone to get a bit closer here. Um, here we go. I'm waiting for my remote slideshow to start. That's cool. Okay. <clears throat> and so you should all be able to see me at this point. You should also be able to hear me. And I'm going to share my slideshow right away. Let me see whether this is all going to work. Screen show for video clip. Here we go. Number one, number two. So this is my first slide and you should be able to see something at this point. And here we go with the panel. That's cool too. And we have a chat window. Okay, cool. Ah, things are working. Oh, that's wonderful. Modern technology. <clears throat> Sorry. Okay, folks. So this talk is about learning the language of failure. And um, obviously there is a lot of, there's a lot of words in that title, which, all, which I'm all going to use to highlight specific aspects of what I'm going to talk about. Um, I have posted a 30 second summary of my slides on Twitter. Um, if you are if, if, if you are really short on time, you may, you may want to switch to that one because this one is not going to take 30 seconds, it's going to take a bit more and it's hopefully also going to get a bit deeper and wider and I hope uh, you're all going to have some fun. The first thing I'm going to point out in this title is the word failure. Now, if only it would work. So, failure, failure, failure. Come on, come on. Sorry, for some reason, I can't switch my slide forward. Here we go. Ah, failure. So I have been obsessed with failures all of my life. I'm actually happy to see my own face associated with failure because that what summarizes the results of my research. Uh, I have been working on debugging failures. Um, still as a, a PhD student, I had written a, together with my student, Dorothea Lütkehaus, I have written a front end to the then command line GNU debugger, GDB. This was <clears throat> a pretty popular thing in particular because it was able to visualize data structures and also be one of the very first actually open source available uh, UI front ends with debugging. So this actually became a GNU program with nice letters from Richard Stallman and all. After my PhD, I did some work on mining failure data <clears throat> which means that we would go and um, and uh, <clears throat> analyze version repositories and bug repositories to find out where the most failures would occur. This, for instance, what you see here in the background is a map is all the components of Firefox at the time, and <clears throat> the uh, squares that you see here in red are those places where the most vulnerabilities were fixed over time. And if you look at the lower left corner here, for instance, this is JavaScript. And you can see that there were plenty of vulnerabilities fixed in JavaScript for all times. These are techniques which have now been adopted by lots of, uh, <clears throat> by lots of major software vendors, Microsoft uh, being one of them, uh, to find out where the most problems are and where to direct your testing and reviewing efforts. <clears throat> one thing I'm <clears throat> particularly famous for is a technique for simplifying failures. And the idea here is that you do have some program of sorts and this program, let's make this some interpreter, gets a rather complex input. Let's assume we have an interpreter for that among others, accepts arithmetic expressions and here we have one. And 
it gets this arithmetic expression and well, then it fails. And the thing is that uh, if you have a very big input, there, is, there are typically only a couple of characters in there, a small subset of this input, which actually suffices to produce the error because there's lots of irrelevant stuff, at least from the failure perspective, uh, as it comes to the as it comes to the as it comes to the input, and uh, what I invented uh, also this was briefly after my PhD is a technique which I named delta debugging. Delta debugging is a technique. It's um, very it's a very simple technique, and to my defense, I should point out that it took me a year or so to make it that simple. Um, is a technique which simply does a couple of experiments on the input. It goes and takes away parts of the input and sees whether this reduced part actually still reproduces the error. We can do this with this arithmetic expression, taking away the second half of the input. Well, what you get is not a valid arithmetic expression, so the interpreter is going to choke on that. Um, it continues by taking away the other half, and the interpreter also does not know what to do with this because this also is not a valid arithmetic expression. And the fun part about delta debugging is that it then goes along and uh, cuts away smaller parts of the input, smaller and smaller parts of the input, in order to increase the chances of having something that is actually valid. And uh, if it takes away this smaller part, for instance, and it turns out that the failure still occurs, then it now has reduced the input somewhat. And if we repeat this again and again and again, then <clears throat> you will en eventually end up with a very small input. And this very small input still is sufficient to reproduce the failure. <clears throat> These two last things, actually, um, this um, delta debugging technique and this mining of software repositories, actually uh, were crucial in making me uh, a fellow of the ACM to quote for contributions to automated debugging and mining software archives. ACM fellow is quite a thing. There's about 10 fellows of the ACM in all of Germany right now. And I was uh, one of the youngest ever getting that. So <clears throat> you, what you, you can learn from that, that simply if you look long enough at failures, you're actually able to make a career out of these. So. You can mine version and bug histories to find out where the failures are. You can simplify inputs to find out what causes the failure. And yes, you can make a career out of that. So <clears throat> this is just a bit of input, just a bit of input of my connections to failures. And now <clears throat> let's uh, speak a bit about the language of failure. What do I mean by the language of failure? Well. To start with, the input that, uh, the, this big input that I've shown you before is not an input that I would carefully craft myself by writing an appropriate test. No, this is an input that would be generated automatically using the well-known technique of fuzzing, which is the art of producing random inputs to a program in order to make these programs fail. There's quite a number of techniques on, of fuzzing, and I'm sure there are plenty in the audience in here who are actually working on that very actively. And uh, it, however, fuzzing is not as simple as it sounds simply, uh, simply prepending random characters to each other doesn't really work. So if I take, say, the standard characters of what make arithmetic expressions, I'm going to end up <clears throat> with plenty of sequences of parentheses and digits and operators. Well, but all of these inputs are going to be invalid and they're going to be rejected by the interpreter right away. And you can find bugs with these, in particular in the error handling of the interpreter and the very initial, and the very initial um, parsing of these things before they get rejected. But if you, want to, if you want to find out any deeper stuff, if you want to get beyond just the basic input processing, what you need <coughs> is valid input, syntactically valid inputs. And the way to obtain these syntactically valid inputs is by specifying what such an input looks like. It's by specifying the language of the inputs as the set of inputs. Now, grammars is something, well, that indeed specifies a language, a set of inputs. And this is also what I mean by the language of failure, naming a set, namely a set of inputs that cause a failure. And um, <clears throat> Some of you may have had grammars somewhere in CS 101 or maybe in formal languages. Some of you may have them in good memory. Some of you may have them in worse memory. Uh, <clears throat> rest assured, I'm not going to go through all the stuff of formal languages in here because I want to put grammars to use. What's a grammar made of? We do have 
expansion rules that tell which, how to expand individual elements into others. We have non-terminal symbols. These come in these angular brackets. And we have terminal symbols, which do not, which do not get uh, expanded anymore. If you had courses in compiler construction, you will have learned how to turn grammars into very efficient parsers for all sorts of languages. However, we're going to use grammars for something different. Namely, we're going to use grammars as producers, as producers of inputs that actually um, adhere to the language. So how does this work? Um, it all works by coming up with a start symbol. Here's a start symbol. Now we go through the individual rules of that grammar by actually, exchange, by actually taking the symbol on the left-hand side and replacing it with what, it, what is on the right-hand side. So we just exchange start by expression. And here we have a rule for expression. And now I can say, OK, I'm going to choose randomly one of the possible uh, expansions for that. And I'm going to expand expression into term minus expression. And now I can continue this with the other non-terminals here. There's two term and expression. So we're going to expand term, say, into factor. And now I'm going to take factor and replace it into int dot int, uh, obviously a floating point number. And I'm going to take this int, which is a sequence of digits or a single digit. I'm going to make things fast here. And I'm going to expand this to a single digit. And <clears throat> I can do the same for the other int too. Now I have digit dot digit minus expression. And I can now, ex now, now I can expand these digits into terminals. First digit becomes an eight. The other digit becomes a two. Now I have 8.2 minus expression, and this expression is still something I can expand. And if I keep on expanding and expanding, and not only choosing the short alternatives, but also longer ones, I will eventually end up in this string, which we just have seen as our initial input. Namely, this is the input which causes our assumed failure in the interpreter. And this is how you can use grammars to produce inputs that are syntactically valid all the time by construction. And this allows you to actually dig much deeper into, dig much deeper by construction into individual programs than what you would get with random inputs. So these <coughs> grammars can be used to parameterize a fuzzer, and this then goes into an interpreter. And this is actually something that, uh, this is actually something that was, well, if you're in formal languages, then using a grammar as a producer is not exactly exciting. But from a fuzzing standpoint, this actually is exciting. Although it's, if you're a theory guy, then you know, oh, this is all obvious. But if you're, a, if you're, if you're interested in testing and fuzzing, this comes to you as a revelation, can come as it. Because and we also had that revelation, and that's now eight years ago. Uh, we had a, had a very an extremely gifted uh, master student. His name is Christian Holler. And what he did was he took a JavaScript grammar and used this to create a grammar-based fuzzer out of it. This is the Langfuzz fuzzer. We had this at Usenix Security and eight years ago. And this Langfuzz fuzzer would then take this JavaScript grammar and create JavaScript inputs for, well, for all the major browsers, be it uh, Chrome, be it Firefox, be it Edge. And uh, this uh, fuzzer would uh, very quickly produce lots and lots of valid JavaScript programs. And it would also find bugs in the JavaScript interpreters of these browsers. Actually, not just three bugs, but uh, actually in the first four weeks of running his, brow of running his Langfuss fuzzer, uh, Christian made more than $50,000 in bug reports. And it was immediately hired by Mozilla uh, just, just immediately afterwards, such that it would be less costly for Mozilla to actually uh, pay out all the bug reports. He, he makes good money with that. He's still with Mozilla. And to date, his tool has, four, has found more than 2,600 bugs in all the major browsers. So next time you're using a browser, or actually, if you're looking at this talk through your web browser, one of the reasons your browser works as expected is actually through grammar-based fuzzing. So, um, and he, 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 Christian still runs his tool all day long and he's paid for by Mozilla. He has a side business with Google. Oh, this is lots and lots of fun. So yes, you can make quite an existence out of failures too. Um, so this is about language of failure. If you do have a specification for a language, this trivially gets you infinitely many syntactically valid inputs, which is great. There's zillions of ways to combine this to guide the generation 
uh, by either the coverage of your grammar, such that each and every element in your grammar or combinations thereof are being covered, or you can combine this with code coverage, such that you find out over time which elements are related to which code, co to, to which, um, code coverage and let you guide by that. Or you can let, let yourself guide by probabilities, by assigning more higher or lower probabilities to individual parts. And this is also very easily taught and very easily applied. And I happen to know both of this because I actually, together with uh, my great co-authors, uh, Rahul, Marcel, Gordon, and Christian, uh, I wrote a book on that, fuzzingbook.org. It's an online book with plenty of online examples too. You can try out the individual code pieces right within your browser. And this is where I have uh, compiled uh, many, where well, I've built and, comp uh, and compiled together many uh, central algorithms and approaches to fuzzing. And if you're into fuzzing, this is certainly something that you can look into in order to learn the basics of it and also to get a couple of um, nice little Python algorithms and building blocks to build your own fuzzer. So this is what we have about the language of failure. And the language of failure, something to be specified by grammar. Yeah, specification, that's the problem because people don't like to specify, even if it's something as simple as a grammar. My experience in 30 years in my profession, people don't like specifications. It's horrible. Many of my colleagues assume everybody loves formal specifications. Well, maybe everybody in their environment does. In my environment, people don't like these too much. So we go to, new, we go to something different, namely learning such languages. The thing is, you do have these you do have the grammar and the grammar influences the fuzzer and the fuzzer goes in produce input for the interpreter. But where do we get this grammar from in the first place? And writing such a grammar actually can be something easy if you would just want a couple of inputs. But if you want a grammar that is fairly complete, has all the bells and whistles and everything, this can easily set you back a couple of weeks. And if you want to fuzz things, you're under pressure and everything, that's not something you want to invest. So in the past years, we've designed a couple of techniques that actually go and mine such grammars automatically from existing programs. The idea is that you do have an existing program, say, here's a very simple parser, let's assume some C program um, that parses expressions, and this is written in classic uh, recursive descent style. This is the textbook way of constructing, of, of constructing uh, parsers. And this is then something which eventually represents the grammar implicitly. And the idea is to take this code as you have it down here and to actually extract the grammar automatically up here. How do we do that? Well, the first thing to realize here is that there's a specific, that there's a correspondence between the structure of the code or more precisely the way the code operates and the actual implicit grammar that you have up here. So for instance, what we see down here, we have, an, we have a function that parses an expression and the first thing it does is it parses the term because it all begins with a term. And then it looks at, a, at whether the next thing is a plus or a minus, and then it parses another expression if that's the case. And this correspondence is something that we can exploit in order to re-extract the grammar again. For this, we introduce a concept which we call consumption. And this is the idea is that every single character in the input is processed somewhere in the parser. And we can, by, by, by a technique called dynamic taint tracking, we can actually track where these characters are being accessed while the program executes. And we can also track uh, where they are being consumed last in the program. So in our case, this plus here, for instance, uh, is consumed in the method parse expression because there is no other method before or after that which would actually process this character anymore because at this point the input is already processed. So we can associate the individual characters when they're being processed with methods and locations and also branches of the function of the program where they're being looked at. And uh, <clears throat> this is precisely what we do. So let's again take our failing input, one times eight minus five. Um, <clears throat> we now go and find out where these characters are being consumed in our um, C program. And it turns out that the one is being consumed in parse digit, uh, so is the eight and so is the five, because this is the function which actually checks which digit is being read. 
There's also the multiply and the minus and the parentheses, and all of these also have their individual places in our parser where they are being processed. Now let me give this a, let me give this a bit of another representation, and you will already see that there's some kind of structure in here, and this structure in particular comes to me because these functions do not operate in isolation. They call each other. They are dependent on each other because parse term actually invokes parse factor, parse factor invokes parse expression. And if we also add this call hierarchy to it, then this is the tree we get. And this is already something that looks suspiciously like what we call a parse tree in, com and <coughs> in uh, compiler construction, because um, this actually now also represents the hierarchy of the individual elements. A factor is a term, an expression is a factor, a digit is an expression. And if we, if, if we additionally also add the other functions that are also called in there without them consuming anything, then we actually get a pretty complete parse tree. Now I'm going to, now I'm going to replace all these individual uh, function names by non-terminals and I can do this automatically by identifying the noun in the identifier that's being used. Turns out that uh, programmers actually tend to use specific naming schemes. And if we look at the nouns in the identifiers, what we get actually is something that works pretty well as uh, names for non-terminals. And this now is a real parse tree as we, would, as, as we would expect this from a parser construction. And this, these parse trees, which we get for each and every input of our program is now something that we can extract a grammar from. And I'll also show you how this works. Um, the, the idea is that, of course, this parse tree is, a, is something that could be an instantiation of a specific grammar. Let's take a look into this particular um, part of the tree. We have a term that obviously is expanded into terms times a factor. Now we can extract this term over here and we can create a rule. Obviously, there must be a rule that a, that a term becomes a, a term times a factor. So here we go. And actually a term can also become a factor so we can extract this right away again from the tree. We can do a similar thing for a factor and expression. A factor obviously can expand into, uh, some, into an opening parenthesis uh, followed by an expression and followed by a closing parenthesis. Here we go. And there's also another alternative for factor because as we can see from the tree, a factor can also become an int. And if we continue this, this is the grammar that we can extract from the parse tree. And now this is not a complete grammar for arithmetic expressions yet. Yeah, obviously there is no addition in there, no, uh, no division and the set of digits also leaves a bit to be deserved. So that's what we know as from our experience. But if we feed in more inputs into our, into our grammar miner now, say zero plus two, then we get another parse tree and then we can actually expand our grammar such that it now also contains these pluses and the digit two and the zero in there. And if we give it another, uh, in, if, we, if we give it another input, such that um, all of these, um, such that we actually cover these individual variations, then the grammar will also be complete. Now it actually has all the various, uh, all the various, uh, all the various um, uh, bells and whistles of arithmetic expression as we have seen in the very beginning. We have built a tool called MIMIT, a grammar miner. That's actually, when I say we actually at this point, this is always my students and me, and my students is, should be heavily underlined, or my postdocs and me. In this case, this is Rahul Gopinath who has invented this. Um, we have a tool called MIMIT, which is a grammar miner, takes, which takes a C and Python, a Python program and a couple of inputs. And from the execution of this program with these inputs, it produces an input grammar. And this input grammar can now be passed into a fuzzer such that we can generate more inputs out of this, all of them syntactically valid. We can also generate a parser out of it such that we can parse and later mutate inputs. Or actually we can also give this directly to a human. And this human thing is particularly, is something that I find particularly interesting because the inputs that we get, the grammars that we get are actually very well readable. That's because of us using the identifiers from the program in order to 
in order to show what the structure is made of. If you look at formal languages, grammars, it's always something like A, B, C, C, B, A, whatsoever. These are the non-terminals. Well, we could give these non-terminals actual names because we do have the programs where they're originated from. And what you have here, for instance, this is a JSON grammar. What is a JSON? JSON is a JSON draw. What is a JSON draw? It's either a string or it's a list or it's a dictionary or it's a number or it's true or false or null. This is almost textbook quality. What is a, what is a list? Well, a list is either a closing, well, this is the end of the list, we always have an opening part. Uh, what is a list? A list is a square bracket, or it is another JSON element followed by zero or more, more JSON elements separated by commas and then a closing bracket, or it is the same just followed by one or more and again one or more. Why do we have two rules here where well, one, would, one would actually suffice? Because that's actually the way the micro JSON parser is written. The, our, our structure in here very well reflects the structure of the underlying parser. And what you can see here is you can, actually, you can actually see what a list is made of. You can see what a dictionary is made of. You can see what a number is made of. And this is all stuff you can give to a human. And uh, being able to give this to a human actually allows the human to take this grammar, open it in the editor, and then manipulate it. Um, for instance, one could go and say, okay, I, I, I want, I'm actually not interested in lists at all. I'm going to give this just a probability of 10%, and I want plenty of dictionaries because I want to test dictionaries, and I'm going to add, I want zillions of dictionaries. Please generate me as many dictionaries as, we, as you can, and you give this to the fuzzer, and the fuzzer then is going to produce dictionaries. Or what a human can also do, <clears throat> um, well, we can add specific values of interest. For instance, we can say that uh, instead, of a, instead of a regular string, a random string, we want to have a very specific string, which is, say, drop table students. And those of you who already had their security 101 course will e easily recognize that this is a typical example of a SQL injection. And if we now give this to, and this SQL injection actually is something that a fuzzer and also a grammar miner, unless you give it the input, will not be able to synthesize under virtually no circumstances. But if you as a human can insert that because you know about SQL injection, well, you can feed this into the fuzzer. And then the fuzzer is going to produce inputs like these uh, with well, well, it's going to be one JSON with drop table students, and another one with uh, JSON with drop table students. Everywhere there's drop table students in your inputs, and you're going to feed this to a program of your choice. And yes, if there's a chance to find some SQL injection somewhere, I mean, you can generate millions of these inputs uh, in a minute. Uh, if there's some, if there's some chance of a SQL injection, um, there's quite some chance that you will be able to find this. Uh, I should put out a warning here. This is the fine print in the lower right corner. Do not try this at home, your university or anywhere else. And in particular, do not try this. At, do not try this out at uh, Ruhr University Bochum. I uh, hear you have just recovered. Please do this. Do this only. Do this only with trained professionals in a professional environment. But this is also an idea of what these fuzzers mean for security. Okay. So this is our grammar miner, and we evaluated this on a number of subjects, pretty complex languages actually. So we started with calc, this is arithmetic expressions, and this goes up to tiny C and JavaScript, which is quite a feat because we can actually extract these, uh, we can actually extract languages of this complexity, and pretty good so the mind grammars can generate 98% of the actual language, we have golden grammars to compare this, the, so, which means that we cover almost the entire language. Uh, we, we also cover a lar the largest part of the grammar uh, of the language when parsing inputs. And this not only works for recursive descent parsers, this also works for modern combinatorial parsers. This, work, this works if you have branches instead of calls. Um, the only thing it cannot do is table-driven parsers. But table-driven parsers tend to be nobody tend to be generated from a grammar from a grammar specification in the first place. So there's actually not much need uh, for a grammar extractor for these uh, programs anyway. So this is about learning the language. And as you can see, we can learn very readable language specifications automatically. They're accurate. All we need is the program itself. And I uh, forgot about this. 
we don't even need input samples. Why don't we need input samples? Um, this was the picture. You clearly see inputs in there. Um, that's because we have a special technique called uh, so-called parser directed test generator. This is a test generator down here, which is specifically tuned to cover all the individual branches of, uh, the, of a lexical analysis or a syntactic analysis, that is lexers and parsers. And this is, uh, <laughs> I could give another talk about these, this is so cool. Uh, but what these things do is they systematically produce inputs that cover all the elements of a language. They are much slower than our grammar miners and certainly much slower than a grammar-based fuzzer. But what this means is you can actually take a program, first, first, first throw this into a parser-directed test generator, then you get inputs from, then you, get, then you can throw this into MIMIT or grammar miner, then you get an input grammar, and then you have all the other benefits. So this is what I do by learning the language. So we are getting closer in and actually getting to get, getting the full picture of our title. Because the next step is learning the language of failure. Now we are going to tie these techniques of language learning back to our problems of failing programs. So what is the problem we want to solve here? Well, it's actually a very simple problem. You have some input that yes, creates a failure. And the problem is for which other inputs does this actually hold? This is a very important question because if you do not understand this correctly, then your fix may not be adequate, which means that uh, you may not check for the exact circumstances, your fix may not check for the exact circumstances. And this also means that um, your fix may be incomplete, there might be other inputs that still work. We have this for vulnerabilities all day long. We have this, we have fixes that only check the symptoms for, of a very specific input that is known to cause the exploit so far so good. But believe it or not, next week somebody comes with the variant of the exploit and it's still not patched. We have this all day long. And this is actually simply checking for whether there's another input for which some particular fixed vulnerability occurs is one of the main techniques to actually find more vulnerabilities. So it's important to know when a program actually fails and when this exactly holds or not. In order to find out, in order to find out this language, the set of inputs, uh, <clears throat> we need to go a bit further. We need to go from, we need to make a step back from individual inputs. We need to go to actually languages. And what we do here is as follows. We take these concrete inputs and given our input grammar, which we now can assume because we can synthesize it, we feed these into a parser. And the parser is going to give us, well, a parse tree. Now oh, this, is, this is now a parse tree which, which, we, which we can directly generate out of the grammar. This is standard stuff. And now we know what the structure of the input is. And since we know what the structure of the input is, we can actually use this very structure to generate inputs that are closely related. So if you want to know whether the failure occurs for other integer values, for instance, well, what can we do here? Well, we can replace one integer by another integer. That is, we take away the one integer down here. Now we have an incomplete parse tree. And since we have the grammar now, all we need to do is we, can, we need to expand this whole thing. We need to expand this integer again, according to the rules of the grammar. And then we get another integer, say a random integer actually. Now we have say 27, for instance, and we can take this very input and feed it again into our program under test and whoops, the error occurs again. Ah, now we have two inputs for which the program fails. That's very neat. And we can repeat this a couple of times. So we already seen our original input for which it failed. And here's the other variant for which it failed. And we can generate as many of these as we like, say three or 205 or whatever. And this now, if you do this frequently enough, we can assume that the error actually occurs for any integer at this point. And this is an abstraction step. It's, um, it's a bit unsound because we can only assume this from a number of, of uh, existing inputs. But this is a generalization, a generalization which we can easily verify. Well, does it actually hold and how many times does it hold? We can even abstract further. And if we abstract further, we may, we may end up with a pattern that looks like this. Actually, the error occurs whenever our multiplication is being used in conjunction 
with a minus sign. This is a pattern we can now give to a human uh, here. These are all the circumstances uh, that the error occurs. And actually instantiating this pattern gives us plenty of inputs with expression times expression minus expression, which all, which all uh, reproduce the failure and which can also be used as test cases for the failure. So if you design a fix for the problem, if you design a fix for the failure, you can use all these test cases to check whether you actually, whether you actually address them all. And yes, you can again have millions of these as you like. Um, <clears throat> so this is something that we have built. We, all this is fairly recent work, by the way. Uh, has these, these are all things that have just appeared at conferences. This one is actually one that got us a best paper award uh, later this year at uh, ISTA 2020. We call this DD set, which is delta debugging on set. And what this DD, what DD set does is it takes a program, it takes a concrete failing input, and it takes a grammar. And, um, and DD set then produces these patterns of failure out of them. And uh, yes, we also evaluated this on a number of real bugs with real programs and for 19 out of 22 bugs, we could abstract those inputs into patterns. Again, we have, uh, again, uh, the, all of these inputs generated are syntactically valid. This is by construction. 92% uh, of these actually also were semantically valid, meaning that we also got identifiers right and everything. Uh, the large majority of these actually reproduced the failure. And these are things, and these patterns can serve as diagnostics explaining why the failure happens as well as producers. But we can even go further than that. Uh, because, see, we have these input features and we have generalized this input into a pattern. But, you know, failure could also still occur for other inputs. What, what do we know about division? What do we know about addition? Does this happen there too? Or does the failure maybe depend on uh, features that are not, not actually structural? say the actual values of individual expressions or length. Sure, length, length is an important feature, sure. If your user ID is more than 1,024 characters, you get an overflow. That's uh, yep, not entirely uncommon. So we thought about that and we wondered, hey, how can we get such input features and how can we learn whether such input features would actually, would actually correlate with failures? So what we do is we built some, we built a bit of a language to actually extract such features, which means that we look for the uh, existence of individual elements. So we have specific productions that either are in the input or not. Also non-terminals, there's a one, there's a five, there's an eight in this input. We also have length features, that is the maximum length of an individual element. We also have maximum values and minimum values. And we also have length of individual elements. I had that already. And these are all features that apply to this particular input. And the question is, in all these, in all these features that the inputs had, that the inputs are, that the input has, are there any features in there which correlate with, with failure? To determine such correlations, there's a not entirely unsuccessful branch of computer science that deals with that. Uh, this is machine learning. And yes, we applied machine learning for this very purpose. The way this works is as follows. Um, we have this program and the program gets an input and the input then produces either a pass or a fail. That's simple. From the inputs, we deduce features. And then we have input features. And these input features can actually now be fed into a machine learner because these input features are actually labeled. So they're labeled with pass or fail. So we have features that would be associated with pass and we have features that would be associated with fail. So we feed this into a learner of our choice. And what the learner then produces is a model. And this model essentially takes inputs and the features and then again predicts whether for this particular input, we're going to have a pass or a fail. Now, this is the, this is the very high level view. The, interesting thing about this approach is that what the learner here does actually is that it replicates the behavior of the program as far as this pass or fail is concerned. So you can think of the learner actually extracting a behavior model uh, that is specific to pass and fail. 
you get a slice of the program's behavior and maybe a slice that is simple enough that we can easily understand it. So, um, how does this work? Well, we train a classifier, we have these labeled inputs, we have their features, and we pipe them into a learner. We use decision tree learners because decision tree learners have the nice benefit of being, of producing um, diagnoses that are particularly uh, easy to understand for humans, which is for us uh, um, an, important, uh, an important argument. You could also use any classifier of your choice, make it an SVM, make this a neural network. These, are, these, these, these will probably have, these may even have a uh, much higher accuracy, but will not be so crisp in their diagnosis because these diagnoses are pretty neat, which I'm going to show in a second. So you take these features, these are labeled, these go into a decision tree learner, and then the decision tree learner is going to produce, well, what? A decision tree. And this decision tree is going to tell you that which features can be used to distinguish between pass and fail. And this decision tree <laughs> could, would actually, could actually look like this. If there is an eight in the input, the number eight, it fails. And if there is no number eight in the input, it passes. This is an observation that intuitively for us as humans is not probably not going to be it. There's probably not going to be any code in the program that specifically checks for a number eight. But this observation actually is consistent with all the inputs that we've seen because the one input that failed had a digit eight in it and the inputs that passed did not. Okay. Uh, actually, this is just random. It could actually be, it could also be another feature. It could also be the length of integers is, if, if the length of integers is always less than one, then it fails. Otherwise, it passes. Well, that's because our two passing inputs here actually happen to have uh, two digit numbers in there, whereas our failing one doesn't. So you already see where the problem is. Yeah, you can, of course, feed this into a decision tree learner. And as any machine learner expert will say, well, if you don't have sufficiently many inputs, uh, then you're not going to end up with a very useful classifier. So the problem is, which is actually a standard problem also in machine learning, you need more inputs, you need more data. And where do you, the problem is, where do you get this data from? <sighs> Surprise we are in a setting where we can actually generate as many inputs as we like. We could, for instance, use the grammar to produce just millions of inputs and then train a learner from. But actually it turns out that um, this is not the best strategy because failures, well, in a reasonable program, are pretty rare. So even if you, if you, generate, if you generate a million inputs and uh, Every one in that input is going to, every one of these is going to pass except for one or two. This is not going to give you a great data set. So what we do is uh, we do something different. We look at the model and we generate inputs from this very model in order to, re in order to refine it. What does this mean? Well, it's actually very simple. We have this uh, decision tree and from the decision tree, we look at the decision tree and then we say, okay, the decision tree forms a hypothesis on why, the, on why the failure occurs. And now we generate more inputs with and without the deciding feature, which in our case is the deciding feature eight. So we generate more inputs that actually do have the digit eight in them and we do generate more inputs that do not have the digit eight in them. That's fairly easy because we can generate all of these. And then we retrain the decision tree learner so is it really the existence of eight that makes it and that makes a difference? No, it's not because now you train it and now the decision tree learner settles on other features. Actually, and what it now settles on is much more interesting. It finds out, is there a multiplication in the input? And is there an expression in parentheses? Yes, then it fails. Because now this is the common feature set for all the for all the failing inputs that we've seen here. You see multiplication, 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 and uh, some expression in parentheses. And if we repeat this game now, we would repeat this again. Now we would generate plenty of inputs with multiplication, with and without parentheses, and we would generate more parenthesized expression with and without multiplication. If we repeat this a couple of times, I think it was 83 times, there's a number of iterations there. What we get is this decision tree, 
And this decision tree now actually is very, very nice because it actually captures four different patterns under which the, under which the failure occurs. So we have expression, time, expression minus expression, expression multiplied with expression plus expression, expression minus expression divided by expression, expression plus expression divided by expression. If any of these four patterns occurs, then the program fails. Otherwise it passes. So now we have four patterns that all explain when the failure comes to be. And these patterns actually are all, well, they all point to the same, to the same effect. All these are instances when the distributive law can be applied. So because A times, uh, A times B minus C becomes A times B minus A times C, there you go. And in our interpreter, this may play a role at some point, and this is why the failure, why the failure comes to be. And this can now be used as an explanation of the circumstances of the failure, can be used as a producer for myriads of inputs, and also as a predictor. You can actually use these patterns to predict whether a program is going to fail. So you could use this as some sort of scanner, like a virus scanner, to find out, oh, this input is probably going to cause the program to fail, so let's better, let's better not do this. And um, <clears throat> since, um, and all of this is something that we have actually implemented in a tool called Alhazen. Alhazen, this is Alhazen. I'm not sure whether you know the name, but uh, he actually is a highly influential researcher. Uh, Alhazen uh, was an Arab mathematician uh, between 900, he was born in 965 until about 1040. And he was uh, an optics researcher. And he was the, apparently the first human ever, or the first scientist ever, to apply what we, call the, what we call the scientific theory, namely taking a couple of, taking a couple of observations, from these observations, deduce hypotheses, and, these, and then use experiments to refine these hypotheses again and again. And Alhazen did so 400 years before the European Renaissance reinvented the concept and came up with the modern, of, of the, the modern concept of experimental science. So we called it Alhazen because what we actually do in here is pretty much the same. Our, our models that we extract about passing or failure are hypotheses, and we run additional experiments to refine or refute them. We get more observations, and this is how we do this cycle again and again. So, and this is why we named our tool after Alhazen. Alhazen takes a program and a bunch of failing and passing inputs and a grammar, and then it runs the cycle of observations and refinements, produces a model, and the model can then take an input and tell us whether this is going to pass or fail. And um, strictly speaking, the inputs of passing and failing inputs, we actually do not need them um, because, well, we can generate these from a fuzzer because we have a grammar. And strictly speaking, the grammar is also something we don't need because we can mine the grammar from the program. So conceptually, all we need is a program and then you run Alhazen and then you get findings about the program when the program is going to pass or fail, assuming you find sufficiently many failures of it. We have evaluated Alhazen again on a set of um, on, on a set of programs, JSON interpreters, JavaScript interpreters, GNU find, GNU grep. These are well the usual Unix commands. And it turns out that Alhazen is pretty good as a predictor. It classifies 92% of all inputs correctly. As a producer, two thirds of produced inputs correctly cause failures. This is this. See, oh, why does it? What what happens with the remaining third? Uh, the interesting, uh, you have to keep in mind that uh, compared to any other test generation technique, these are still astonishingly high numbers. Um, fuzzer of your choice maybe generates a failing input, maybe once in a thousand or once in a million. And these decision trees actually also are pretty small, meaning that they refer to only a small set of input elements, meaning that they are, they, meaning that as a user, you can concentrate on a small set of uh, input features that actually determine things. Uh, what do I mean by that? Let me give you two examples. Uh, here's a grep crash. 
So um, we have encoded all the options of grep into, uh, into a grammar, as well as uh, all the command line arguments. So um, this, is an, this is an error we have found. So if there, is, uh, if there is an option fixed strings in the input, and if the length of the search string is zero, then grep crashes. And under all other circumstances, it does not, which, well, at least nothing in the surroundings of uh, the original failing input that we found. And this is an immediate description of the circumstances under which the program fails. Here's another one, my personal all-time favorite adventure game. This is NetHack, a successful Dungeons and Dragons slashing since, oh, for 40 years, I guess. Um, NetHack recently had a CVE. Uh, it crashes when a, a line in the configuration line is too long. What does too long mean? Well, we find out, Alhazen finds out, that this precisely occurs if the length of the line element in the configuration file uh, is, has 620 characters or more, then it fails. If it's 619 or less, then it passes. Immediate, so again, you get an immediate diagnostic of the circumstances under which the error occurs. So what you get here is, you look, we can learn behavior models that explain, produce, and predict failing behavior. The, Neat thing also is that uh, all these diagnoses that we, that we produce refer to something that is in the program input, that is, something, that is something in the problem domain rather than any internals. If I tell you that in NetHack, NetHack crashes because the pointer P was null, and this is why you got this, uh, you know, the, the segmentation fault error or something, but that's not going to help you very much. Maybe it's going to help you if the error is in parse dungeon file or whatever. But generally speaking, if you have a diagnosis that refers to all these internals, well, you have to know what the internals of the program is, which is actually what makes up quite some time in debugging, simply understanding how the program works. Well, here you get a diagnostic that refers to the problem domain which actually comes in terms that you can understand because these terms from the problem domain exist independently of the program code. And the last thing is, it doesn't have to be pass or fail because this actually generalizes to arbitrary predicates on program behavior. What do I mean by that? Well, let's, go, let's take a look again at this, um, at this diagram. There are things which are pretty much given say the usage of grammars to turn inputs into features or features into inputs. This is grammars as parsers and producers. You can generalize a bit because it can be arbitrary features, can also be domain specific features beyond these generic ones that we had length or integer interpretation. And that's actually also how you probably use this in a particular domain. The interesting thing here is also that the learner generalizes. It can generalize, it doesn't have to be decision trees. It can be any learner that gives you feedback on how to, pro, how, how to produce more inputs that would support its hypothesis. And there's a whole world of things to be discovered in here. Most interestingly, however, is that um, it doesn't have to be pass or fail. It can be any predicate on program behavior. It can be the question of, is this particular function covered? Is this particular API accessed? Is this vulnerability there? So you can actually actually have a system here that allows you to learn about behaviors, about any behavior, any predicate of interest from a program, as long as you do have one input that triggers it and one input that doesn't. So it's not just the language of failure that we're having here. It's also the language of acceptance which are the inputs that my program accepts. It's also learning the language of coverage. It's learning the language of data leaks. It's also learning the language of exploits. Or maybe even go the other way around and then it's learning the language of security. Because you can also find out which inputs are there which do not cause a particular vulnerability or maybe even many vulnerabilities or maybe even all vulnerabilities. Ah, this is not where we are, nor where we will be in the near future, but it's definitely a goal to work for. Since we already are at perspectives, let me give you an overview of the things that we are working on and that we will be working on in the near future. So 
we have seen how to mine context-free languages from existing programs. But as anyone in formal languages knows, there is a whole stack <laughs> of formal languages. Um, and these are also languages of interest. Context-sensitive languages, for instance, telling us the you telling us the relationship between the usage and the if definition a definition and usage of identifiers for instance uh, speaking about um, binary formats length of individual frames all these are features that are not easily expressed in a context free language but in a context sensitive language they can be or why not just go for universal features directly as we already have shown in alhazen um, the idea here is that you can actually extract numerical features and then uh, try to find and then try to associate these with failures or non-failures, for instance. We have applications here too. Um, you can apply all of these for testing, for generating inputs, for parsing inputs, mutating them. We have seen how to use them in debugging, that is in order to figure out why and when a particular failure occurs. But you could also use these for prevention, for instance, in order to protect a program against malicious inputs. If you had, if you do have a, if you do have a spec of the language that uh, is known not to cause any trouble, well, you can you, you can actually enforce that all the inputs adhere to this language, and then you will protect uh, your program from anything that is out of the ordinary. And then there's various domains. You have batch systems. These are the simple ones. You have a program, program pro processes a bunch of input, and then it uh, produces a result or fails, say like all these Unix utilities. But then there's also stateful systems, reactive systems, and interactive systems, where you also have to encode the current state into the language that is, I am currently on this particular screen, or I am in this particular state in my finite state model. These are things that all need to be extracted and considered. And then there's something which we haven't almost talked about at all, which is individual functions. What happens in my code? And this is also something that which opens up an entire world of things. Because if you think about, if you think about it, here's a failure. Again, this goes into our interpreter and it fails. And somewhere in this interpreter, there's a function. This is actually a function from GCC, which actually, which actually handles this kind of code. Uh, and which actually also, uh, this is a bug I found some 20 years ago, uh, which actually also crashed uh, when being faced with a particular distributive problem. Um, this is from GCC. And um, the question here is, well, so this function is actually also the function that is going to fail, so that's, uh, so that's good to know. What is the input to this very function? So you can see here in the upper right, in the upper right corner, the input is an RTX. What is an RTX? Well, in order to find that out, you have to dig deep into the GCC code. Turns out an RTX is what we call an abstract syntax tree, or actually, uh, or actually more actually conceptually, a parse tree. So this is a function which accepts a parse tree as produced by the compiler parser, and which then goes into this function, and then this function does something bad with it and fails. And uh, this function already, this function already, if you think about it, that an entire tree goes in, in, goes in there. And you think about it, uh, uh, yeah, where can we get these trees from? How can we get these trees? It's amazing. You see, there's quite a number of, so suppose you want to do unit testing. You want to write unit tests for that function. Then you need a generator of valid abstract syntax trees. Uh, how could you do that? There are unit test generators which claim to be able to test such functions by providing them with valid inputs. Yeah, they can generate maybe one or two nodes in that thing, but most of this is going to be strictly illegal. And no, it's, it's going to be almost impossible to generate only valid inputs for that one. And if you find out that your function crashes on a whatever, on a tree with a loop or whatever, that's not going to be interesting because your parse is not going to produce these. So it very much depends on the context that your function is in, in order to be able to produce inputs. And funny as it seems, we can produce these inputs because, well, if we feed in a valid system input into our interpreter, we get these trees, which we can then feed into the function. But, and we can also generate many more of these, of course, and all of these would eventually go 
into our function of choice, so that's all neat. But if you look at the function in isolation, and you have this x, and you want to do more than just test it, you want to reason about it, you want to do, you want to do symbolic evaluation, you want to do program proofs. For this, you need to know the, you need to know the precondition, you need, to know, you need to know the structure of x, you need to know the type of x, or in our own context, you need to know the language of x. And figuring out how the language of inputs is related to the language of variables, which historically also are two totally disjoint parts, but which for tying all these nice techniques that we do over the function level to the other nice techniques that we do over the system level, ah, yeah, that's, that's a challenge. That's a challenge to work on. And yes, it's a, it's a magnificent challenge and lots and lots of things to be done here. Okay, back to perspectives. So just showing you, we have this very nice Ruby cube where you can combine everything with everything and there's so much more to be done. Um, this is a list of the papers which I mentioned in our, which, which I mentioned in this talk. I should point out that all of, we do, all of all of the stuff we do is, we are very committed to open science and open sourcing our tools and the tools that I've shown here, uh, in particular all the newer ones, they're all available of, as, as artifacts, executable, Jupyter notebooks, you name it. But I'd also like to point out that um, none of these papers was made by me alone. I'm very happy to have been able to work with a set of, uh, with a set of most excellent students uh, and postdocs who have been working with me on this. And it's absolutely great to, be in, to, 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 to work with excellent people all day long. Um, here's the rest of my group. Then, um, unfortunately, I couldn't include all of their papers. And here are the other uh, students and postdocs I've been working with in the past. And these are all the folks that have contributed in some way to all of this stuff that I've, that I've told in here. Uh, I did the slides, they did the work. We both had the ideas on that, but yes, they all should be, they, they all should be very much named and very much credited. So this was learning the language of failure. What have we seen? We have seen how to mine grammars, that is extracting language specifications, input specifications from existing programs for fuzzing, for parsers, for humans, for first humans and then fuzzers, for, for first humans, then parsers, or for, for just for humans alone. We have seen how to make use of such grammars to infer patterns, patterns of failures, that is how to find out under which conditions or for which language your program fails, which, is, um, which has the potential to be a great help in debugging, to quote one of our reviewers. I've <laughs> shown you how to learn software behaviors, that is how to feed uh, large numbers of, of input features, labeled, because we can, into a learner in order to find out under which conditions a particular behavior applies. And I've given you a couple of perspectives at the end. And if you're interested in any of these, any of these works, uh, the easiest way is right now to look up look up my uh, Twitter my Twitter stream, because uh, on most of most of these papers actually have appeared in the last weeks. So and if you scroll back about a week or so from now on, you will actually find me um, showing off many of these papers and future work. And I'll be very happy to um, I, I'm also very happy to take feedback on this very Twitter stream. So that's it, folks. Learning the language of failure. Thank you very much for your attention and I'll be very happy to take questions. Thank you very much.